Welcome uh, to this webinar event on European technology for a greener and carbon-free Hong Kong with a special focus on electric vehicles and waste management. This webinar is organized by the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices in Brussels and Berlin, respectively. It is also our pleasure to have 10 supporting trade organizations from various European countries for today's webinar. I am Alexander de Beer, Chairman of the Belgium Hong Kong Society, and it is my pleasure to act as a moderator for today's event. We will have three speakers for this webinar, and joining us are Mr. Wong Kam Singh, Secretary for the Environment of the Hong Kong SAR Government, Mr. Ivan Christians, General Manager of Capital Segers Belgium, and Dr. Axel Schweitzer, Chief Executive Officer of Alba Group. The first speaker is Dr. Axel Schweitzer, and I'm now passing the floor to him. Dr. Schweitzer, please. Thanks, dear Alexander, um, dear Secretary K.S. Wong, um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First, it's a big honor and joy to um, be part of your webinar today, and um, thanks for, for having me. Um, may I start with the introduction of um, my company, the other group, and let's go to the next slide already, to present the opportunities for resource management in Hong Kong. And first, um, so you know who is Alba, what is, what is Alba. Um, we're actually part of the worldwide um, top um, 10 companies in the field of waste management. Um, we are family owned. Um, we have a history of more than 50 years. Um, we have a great team and um, we've started uh, in Europe, especially or uh, particularly in Berlin, and uh, our DNA uh, is recycling. That's why humbly we call ourselves the recycling company. And uh, I always like to say that because if you look at all the, the website of the big companies, they all look a little bit the same or similar. Uh, actually, one of the big criteria where we think we are a little bit different is uh, because of our recycling DNA. Why do we think so? Because um, especially my parents already started as the pioneers um, at the beginning of the 70s in Berlin, the professional recycling and um, later what they start is the separate collection became the dual system, the green dot system and went viral um, all over the world. Um, I'm actually located in Hong Kong. Um, so. Um, and this since about uh, now almost eight years. Uh, why you could ask, uh, did I do so? Because uh, we are uh, happily uh, selecting from our huge variety of our recycling portfolio, the most suitable uh, activities for Asia. And I will uh, come later to, to mention a few of them and localize them to the Asian market. And, um, asking or being asked about, okay, um, what is our um, dream or vision, etc. I like to um, talk about my son. Uh, I have three children and uh, when we moved to Hong Kong, the oldest one was about five years old and he remembered from Berlin about seven recycling bins in front of our complex and uh, he asked me, coming to Hong Kong, Papa, where are the recycling bins in Hong Kong? And I said, ah, maybe there are not so many. And uh, then he said, said uh, at least at this time, the famous word would have a big impact on me. He said, Papa, you need to change that. And that is something what I really like because as adults, we seem to uh, think in difficulties, challenges, and I like the, the idea that kids just think, okay, if you can think of it, if you can think it, then Let's try and do it. Obviously, we are not successful with everything we do, but um, at least we are trying. And this brings us uh, to um, probably also what uh, Secretary K.S. is referring later to. And we are very happy that um, Hong Kong um, just recently um, published the base blueprint for Hong Kong to set out the direction for 2035. And 
dear Kes, I would like to congratulate you for uh, this blueprint, for what especially you and your team have done. I think that it's going exactly in the right direction in, in the fields of enhancing collection and separation. I will talk about it as later as well. Resource circulation and promoting innovative technologies to enhance efficiency. And last but not least, obviously also contributing to the goal of Hong Kong to become carbon neutral by already 2050. So they are quite ambitious goals and uh, we are really happy that uh, government set out these directions and as the industry that we are um, helping to implement and ideally also supported by the uh, society because that's always uh, very important in our field. Um, let me focus on, as I said, um, actually starting with the collection. Um, we've established smart city logistics. What does it mean? It means, for example, um, starting with electric trucks, with solar panels, um, smart route planning. Um, we have smart bins, the sensors, so these um, so not, you know, the, the bins actually give the signal when they need to be emptied instead of just um, always driving the same route. Um, we have um, smart um, and I also think pretty cool AI solutions um, using also the optic sensors by analyzing the waste so we can improve um, again the recycling and um, we are happy that already we are running these smart city logistics um, for example in obviously in in Europe but uh, we see Asia is even moving faster than, than Europe in this field and uh, besides uh, Europe, it's obviously in Singapore and uh, heavily also in, already introduced in China. So hopefully this is something Hong Kong is uh, moving as well, especially also in the, in the view of the Greater Bay Area. Uh, after the collection, uh, waste needs to be separated and because uh, using individual bins, uh, not everyone is doing it uh, exactly I would say even in the German way, and to be honest, between you, it's like we are a small group, so I can be very honest. Um, even in Germany, they're, they're, they're not so perfect, so it needs to be separated. And um, this, these separation plants, they have a lot of technology. This is something we've developed over the last 50 years, and where we are humbly calling uh, ourselves the worldwide leader in this technology. And uh, these plants can be uh, tailor-made, uh, smaller or bigger, depending on the uh, on the actual uh, um, land possibilities. And we all know, obviously, Hong Kong has scarce land, so they can be also smaller ones. This brings me after the separation to the resource uh, circulation. So uh, the goal always is that the material needs to be brought back into the material loop. This is, by the way, one of our principles of our company, what my father really like started uh, more than 50 years ago. So recycling always starts with bringing back the material into the material loop uh, and uh, like also lives on examples. Uh, so, for example, in Hong Kong, we are happy together with partners uh, as a private initi initiative to uh, build the first of its kind plastic recycling plant was actually um, happening right now. Um, this is the assembling of the plant in Chen Mun, for the ones knowing Hong Kong a little bit better, um, with the support of the government in the Eco Park. So we are very happy um, that we can help hopefully setting the example and um, also hoping that um, government is um, as done in the example I show you after this one, introducing the producer responsibility scheme, because this is the secret and the key why Germany became the worldwide leader in recycling, because of producer responsibility scheme. What does it mean? This means like if uh, producers bringing, uh, for example, their products into the markets or the packaging, uh, then uh, they are also responsible for the recycling and that's uh, a really important step and the first of its kind of the producer responsibility scheme is the electric uh, or electronic waste uh, recycling where uh, we uh, have been uh, very happy and proud that uh, Hong Kong government uh, after uh, the worldwide tender 
that selected um, our group together with uh, New World um, to implement the first of its kind and the uh, so far biggest electronic waste recycling plant in Asia and not only to design, build and operate the plant but also to set up a whole new collection system for Hong Kong what obviously has a lot of, it's a beautiful city as we know but <laughs> it's also quite different from, from obviously um, the European um, setups um, and I'm not only talking about the rice cookers but obviously also about the, the different compounds and um, you know uh, collecting washing machines from, I don't know, 45th floor is a little bit different than to the, to the small houses in, in Europe. So, um, no fear, I won't uh, now talk you through the whole uh, layout. So, just to give you an overview, obviously it's, uh, at least I think it's quite impressive. Uh, as I said, it's uh, initiated by the government and I think this is a great example um, what Hong Kong or where Hong Kong has shown that introducing producer responsibility system does have a big effect and is uh, boosting recycling in Hong Kong and also acts as or stands as a, a raw model for other solutions in Asia and um, for example um, only like a few weeks ago uh, we had been selected by the um, city or country of Singapore to implement the producer responsibility system for Singapore um, by uh, and Singapore had a lot of exchange to Hong Kong. Why is that so important? Because at the end of the day, as I mentioned, it's about um, bringing um, recyclables back into the market and um, over um, the last uh, more than four years um, operating this plant we have been able to bring 55,000 tons of recyclables back into the loop. We are really proud of that because that material would have been lost or you know dumped or um, you know whatever. And this means that uh, we have a recycling rate of more than 87 percent. Um, what we think it's already pretty good, but um, at the same time working on still we what or our own goal is to increase this of about more than 90 percent um, and so we are working on this and um, as you can see this includes the copper, the aluminium, uh, the iron and last but not least the plastics. So I'm very happy to share this experience with you and um, also happy to answer your questions now or later. Alexander, it's up to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schweitzer, uh, for your presentation and uh, congratulations uh, with uh, the achievements uh, made so far. Uh, they are very impressive. Um, we will keep uh, the questions for after the um, presentations. So um, uh, please allow me now to uh, give the floor to uh, Ivan Christians, uh, General Manager of Keppel Segers uh, Belgium. Mr. Christians, the floor is yours. Thanks, dear Alexander, dear Secretary K. S. Wong, and Dear organizers of this event, thank you. I have the pleasure to introduce you to Hong Kong's first integrated waste management system, a facility which is currently under construction. The technology for this plant will be provided by our company, Keppel Seegers. Next slide. Keppel Seegers is the environmental division of Keppel Infrastructure. We are part of Keppel Corporation which is a company listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange. We are a global leader in environmental systems and in urban solutions. Our company, Capital Seagas Belgium, is located near Brussels in an old beer brewery. We are highly specialized in the development of waste energy technology. Next slide. Hong Kong has a population of 7.3 million people. It is one of the most densely populated cities in the world and with limited land available. In 2019, Hong Kong was producing 5.7 million tons of waste per year. About 80% of this, 3.9 million tons, has been sent to one of the three existing landfills. Next slide. So the objective of, this, of the Hong Kong's first integrated waste management facility is to reduce to substantially reduce the amount of waste going to the landfill 
and also to increase and stimulate the recovery of useful resources. The integrated waste management facilities consist of two, uh, of two plants, two facilities. The first one is a waste to energy plant with a capacity of 3,000 tons per day. The second is a mechanical sorting and resources recovery facility of 200 tons per day for demonstration purpose. Altogether, the two facilities will be able to treat more than 1 million tons of waste per year. Next slide. So, what is very special about this project is that it will be built on a place that doesn't exist uh, yet. It is to be built on an artificial island of 16 hectares, and the reclamation of this land is also part of the, of the contract awarded to us. The plant is located on the island Shuk Huichao in the southwest of Hong Kong. Next slide. Once ready, this project uh, the, the, it will be working around the clock, as around the clock operations. The waste will be shipped from the main, the main parts, from the main waste transfer stations in Hong Kong to the artificial A-line island by marine vessels. Every day there will be a delivery of 210 watertight containers. The artificial island has its own harbour with four jetty cranes who will unload the watertight waste containers. So, what are the key components of the waste energy facility? Because waste has to be treated, will be treated 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and the waste delivery is only during the days, there will be a large waste bunker for sufficient storage of, of the waste. The heart of the plant is the great incinerator where combustion is taking place at a high temperature up to 1000 degrees. During the combustion, there is a release of energy and this energy will be transferred into steam in a high, uh, in a high steam pressure boiler. The steam then is sent to the turbine for production of electricity. The waste contains some contaminants and all the contaminants will be removed in a very advanced flue gas cleaning system. This flue gas cleaning system uh, complies with the very stringent standards of the EU and also with the Hong Kong standards. In some parts, like nitrogen oxide, the Hong Kong standards are even more strict than the European standards. The clean flue gases will then be emitted into the stack, which has a height of 150 meters. The incineration will result in a volume reduction of 90% and the residue is bottom ashes. A metal, ferro, ferrous metals will then be recovered from uh, the bottom ashes. Next slide. So what are some of the key environmental features of this integrated waste management facility? It will be producing 480 million kilowatt hours of electricity, which can be exported to the grid. This is the equivalent to about 1% of the electricity production in Hong Kong, and it is sufficient to power 100,000 households. This plant allows to uh, avoid an estimated 440,000 tons per year of greenhouse gases, and it allows to recycle uh, ferrous metals, plastics, glass, and other available materials. The project will have its own desalination plant so that it can be completely self-sufficient and it also has its own wastewater treatment plant so that there will be a zero waste a zero water discharge in the, into the surrounding. From the architectural point of view it has a very extensive greening so that it nicely blends in with the, with the surroundings. Next slide. An important aspect of the plant also is to are the environmental education facilities. There will, a visitor center. there will be an extensive visitor center um, to drive towards a greener Hong Kong. There will be guided tours for the visitors and there will also be various services between the plant and uh, between the, this phase one plant and Central and Chung Chow. So hopefully someday we will all have the chance to visit this plant. Next slide, maybe a few details on the contract itself. The contract has been awarded um, to the joint venture of Capel Seegers and Sun Hua Joint Venture. 
Sunhua as part of China Harbor, which is one of the largest, uh, which is the largest dredging company in the world. And of course, their scope is important as they are responsible for the land reclamation. The contract was awarded to us in November 2017, and it is expected to be completed in 2025. At the peak period, there will be 1,000 people working on the site, and same as for the uh, electronics, includes uh, an operations and maintenance contract. We will be responsible to operate and maintain the plant for a period of 15 years. The total contract value is substantial. It's three, 31 million billion Hong Kong dollar or about 3.3 billion euro. Next slide. So I would like to conclude this slide by, by this presentation by saying that this Hong Kong integrated waste management uh, pro facility phase one is really an iconic project and we are very proud to be part of this uh, iconic project. We look forward to having your questions on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Christians, uh, for your presentation and uh, congratulations also with uh, this project. Um, and I also look forward in the future uh, visiting the uh, facilities and seeing with my own eyes uh, what uh, what Capo has uh, has achieved there. Um, before uh, I give the floor to um, Secretary Wong, uh, may I invite all participants to this webinar to send your questions through the chat box uh, and we will come to them after the last presentation, which is uh, of uh, Secretary Wong, um, Secretary for the Environment of the Hong Kong SAR government. Secretary Wong, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you everyone to join this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, firstly, I would like to say thank you to our friends from Germany and Belgium to help Hong Kong to build uh, ways to resources and ways to energy facilities that can help Hong Kong to catch up to reduce waste and also to improve renewable energy towards our carbon neutrality goal just announced uh, earlier. So I will have a PowerPoint presentation uh, to update you about what we are doing about uh, climate actions, uh, about electric vehicles, and also about waste management. The title today is Greener and Carbon Neutral Hong Kong. Uh, last November, the chief executive in her policy address announced that Hong Kong would go towards carbon neutrality before 2050. In Asia, Hong Kong is one of the few leading cities with such Patch towards carbon neutrality. We'd like to be a leading green city in Asia. Certainly, we need the support from other places, including uh, European unions, uh, to make the best use of technologies to go towards carbon neutrality in Hong Kong. This picture shows our existing climate action plan 2030 plus, setting our target timelines to reduce carbon emissions and to make Hong Kong more climate adaptive and resilient. Uh, we'll update this plan uh, in the third quarter of this year to meet our new target about carbon maturity. And under the climate action plan, there are three interrelated aspects. Because in Hong Kong, there are three major carbon emission sources. Firstly, the biggest is about electricity. Second, about 20% is related to transportation, in particular vehicular emissions. Third is about waste reduction. We just set a number of zero targets. Firstly, as mentioned, Last November, we will go towards carbon neutrality or zero carbon emissions by or before 2050. And electricity emissions to go towards zero carbon sources will be one of the major challenges. Second, is just announced um, very recently, is about the EV popularization roadmap. 
we announced that before 2050, Hong Kong would go towards zero vehicular emissions to tie in with the carbon neutrality goal. And third is that we announced that the waste blueprint is that we would like to go towards waste, zero waste landfill by or around 2035. So these zero, fee zeros are important patches made by the Hong Kong government to make Hong Kong cleaner and greener. As said, the updated climate action plan would be uh, announced um, a few months later. So today I would like not, not to talk uh, much about that, but would like to show you see this picture. It shows that despite Hong Kong's limited land, we would like to support more local and regional zero carbon electricity generation. From this picture, you can see that we are making use of the water bodies in Hong Kong having the floating photovoltaic panel to capture the solar energy to generate electricity. This picture shows a pilot scheme done a few years ago and would expand it to a larger scale to generate more renewable energy. And I can share with you that this floating PV, uh, including components from France, uh, to be adopted in Hong Kong to support Hong Kong's decarbonization process. As said, we just announced the EV roadmap uh, this week in Hong Kong. There are a few key uh, milestones or target. Overall, it's go towards zero vehicular emissions before 2050. And for the pirate cars, we set a 2035 target. Is that by that time, we ban the sales of conventional vehicles and we go just towards pure electric vehicles or equipment that are involving zero roadside emission. Uh, it's an aggressive yet practical patch. Around the world, uh, we are seeing that a similar patch are talking about 2030 to 2040. And we're talking about 2035 is one of the leading cities, again, in Asia with such vision. Certainly, there are many vehicles importing to Hong Kong from Europe and other places. And to make that practical and to be implemented in phases, we need more support from European companies to import relevant electric vehicles to Hong Kong to meet the different needs in Hong Kong, from pirate vehicles to commercial vehicles. And in the coming five years, we are going to test out on, uh, different types of uh, commercial and transport uh, vehicles including single deck buses, double decker buses, uh, mini buses, taxi, lorries, and even motorcycles. So uh, we see the business opportunities in the coming years and decades. Um, in Hong Kong, in fact, the popularization of electric vehicle is in fact uh, pretty encouraging in recent years. Uh, this picture shows the latest figure last year, that means 2020. One out of every eight pirate cars newly uh, registered in Hong Kong, one was electric vehicle. That means about 20.5%. Um, it's one of the highest figure, again, among big cities in Asia, except a few mainland Chinese cities. As said, 2035 is the deadline to cease the new registration of conventional pirate cars in Hong Kong. Um, that target will be subject to review, say, every five years in Hong Kong. So 2035 is probably the latest day. An early day may become possible if the technologies and support, etc., will become more viable. To support the popularization of EV, charging facilities are very important in Hong Kong. I would like to share with you two examples that we are doing in Hong Kong. One is that about 10 years ago, we have an incentive scheme is to ask all new developments to make their car park EV ready when they decide and build the projects. So it's a pretty good uh, advance 
thinking to make Hong Kong's new buildings to become EV ready. Second is to convert or upgrade the existing premises to become EV ready. We launched a two billion Hong Kong dollar scheme to subsidize the existing building to be upgraded, particularly for the domestic buildings, or it's equivalent to a euro more than 200 million. The response has been very encouraging. Our original estimate is that within three years, 60,000 car parks to be upgraded. But the response is that within about four months, more than 60 car parking space in over 200 premises or estates have made their applications. So I think the outcome would be better than our original estimate. And within that uh, uh, state, uh, given the incentive for new buildings and also the new subsidy scheme for existing buildings, in combination, we estimate that in the coming few years, three out of uh, one out of three, this kind of parking space in domestic buildings will become EV ready. That would be a very good support to make the popularization of EV in Hong Kong. I quickly turn to the uh, waste blueprint that we announced that last month. Um, as I said, the target is to reduce waste as source. Second is to promote circular economy so that we can have more resources circulation or circular flow of resources and recycling. Last but not least is to go towards zero waste landfill. From this cover of the blueprint, you can see a new recycling uh, center in Hong Kong. And I, I would like to encourage our German friend, uh, including his son, to visit one of these recycling uh, stores in Hong Kong. Now there are more than 20 uh, across the territory in Hong Kong. The design is simple, clean, and support a whole range of recyclables to be collected there. And you can see the number six, because in Cantonese, six being green means circular flow of resources. As said, waste reduction, resource circulation, zero landfill are the new target, a new vision under the waste blueprint for Hong Kong 2035. I'm not going to go into the details of the blueprints, the blueprints, uh, the full version, and, and also the uh, leaflet uh, available online. Uh, it tells people about the vision, the targets, what we've been doing in the last eight years, including policies, uh, producer responsibility schemes, and also hardware, including the iPad uh, that uh, you heard about uh, uh, earlier, and also OPAP is on food waste recycling, and also YPAP on yard waste, and also TPAP uh, built earlier to treat the sewage slot into energy. And also would like to have new policies and hardware in the forthcoming time so that we can meet the zero waste landfill vision. This picture shows the interiors of the recycling stores that we just launched in the recent months. You can see that it's very tidy, clean, and also have uh, facilities to collect more than eight types of commonly found recyclables in Hong Kong. And there are also incentive scheme that if you're going to uh, put recyclables at the recycling stores that you can collect uh, uh, pawns and in return you can get some rewards. This picture shows one of the waste energy facilities in Hong Kong, quality tea part. And in order to meet our new vision and new target, we need more of this kind of waste to energy facilities and also waste to resources facility in Hong Kong. And I trust the European friends and companies would be interested in joining Hong Kong in this journey towards zero waste landfill. And in the past, say, decade, uh, we calculated our investment uh, in relation to renewable energy, energy saving and green building, uh, green mobility, and also uh, waste, management, waste management facilities, a total of about Hong Kong dollars, 47 billion, or equivalent to Euro 5 billion uh, invested in this 
kind of green, uh, low carbon facilities. And it indicates that in the coming time, when we are setting even more aggressive targets and visions, the investment will be comparable or even more than that. And in our recent budget announcement, we have uh, increased our wind bond initiative so that we can see that um, we would have financial support to make Hong Kong cleaner and greener. So welcome to Hong Kong uh, to visit the carbon neutral Hong Kong and let's join hand to go through the carbon neutrality journey in Hong Kong, in Victor Bay Area, Asia, to make the earth better. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Wong. Uh, in order to create uh, the future, you need to start with a vision. Uh, and thank you for sharing uh, your vision with us. Um, and uh, I am uh, happy to see that uh, the vision has already put into practice. So uh, it is uh, already starting to roll out with your uh, waste blueprint for uh, 2035. Uh, and also very impressed that uh, already one out of eight uh, vehicles in Hong Kong are uh, electrically driven. So uh, congratulations for uh, those achievements. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. Uh, and um, I suggest we now move over to the uh, Q&A. We have many questions uh, coming on the chat box. Um, and I will start with a, a first question, which is from uh, uh, European companies, our, our European friends, to uh, Secretary Wong, with all the initiatives that are being taken in Hong Kong, um, uh, what uh, are they? What are the the, the new business opportunities um, that lie uh, ready for uh, European companies to tap into? And um, uh, can you uh, can you share some ideas and uh, and and let our the European businesses know uh, how they can go about it in order to to come and help the city to achieve its goals? Okay. I think that is the purpose of this uh, webinar to, today. And uh, I think our uh, uh, environmental blueprints actually uh, serve the purpose. It maps out the overall picture and also the targets and also the initiative, including facilities that we are uh, planning and also um, in need uh, in Hong Kong. So there are four uh, broad areas. One is about decarbonization, okay? We have our current climate action plan, uh, showing what we are doing and what we need in Hong Kong. And uh, we are going to update our climate action plan very soon in coming few months, that will tell you more. Second is about the clean air plan that I haven't mentioned. Probably in, again, uh, a few months later, we we'll update our clean air plan in Hong Kong that would tell um, our friends what we're going to do about uh, improving the air quality in Hong Kong. That would involve, on one hand, phasing out the old conventional vehicles. For instance, we have been phasing out um, tens of thousands of old diesel commercial vehicles in the past few years and in the coming years. So European clean uh, diesel commercial vehicles would be in need uh, around that time. And the new key in Japan will tell you more. And not only cars, but also ships in Hong Kong. Because in Hong Kong, the biggest local emissions are no longer about cars, but from the marine emissions. So in Hong Kong, we are having different schemes to use new energy vessels. For instance, for the Victoria Harbors ferries, where we have a plan to make a pilot scheme that there are few pure electric ferries traveling in Victoria Harbor. And for the longer journeys outlying islands, we're going for hybrid ferries. So I think European experience on the new energy ferries, ferries would be relevant to Hong Kong. First is about the, uh, the EV popularization. I think uh, Hong Kong people love uh, 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 different brands of cars and many of the brands are from Europe. In fact, I met uh, some of the European uh, motor companies representative in Hong Kong. And uh, we are all talking about uh, introducing more uh, 
new energy uh, vehicles, in particular electric vehicles, to Hong Kong. Um, certainly, um, not only about cars, but also the charging infrastructure will be important. In fact, the uh, EV roadmap indicates that we would like to make Hong Kong's EV charging infrastructure to become marketized uh, in the coming years. So that I think different companies with experience in providing EV charging levels would be of edge to help Hong Kong to make the EV charging facilities more accessible. Last but not least, it's about the waste blueprint. I think our friends from Germany and Belgium should have uh, shared with uh, our European friends about their local experience. And as indicated in the blueprint, in order to go towards zero waste landfill, we need more waste to energy and waste to resources facilities in Hong Kong to meet our goal. I think these four aspects need our friends' attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Secretary Wang. Um, an interesting question uh, to uh, Dr. Schweitzer. Um, it's actually a double question. Uh, first one, which is the most difficult material to recycle? Um, and secondly, um, the recycled plastics, is it used locally or is it uh, shipped to other countries as manufacturing materials? Um, <laughs> thanks for the question. I start with the, the second part. Uh, the goal is indeed to, to recycle locally, uh, especially since uh, we are supported by uh, you know, some of the big bottlers in Hong Kong and uh, this, uh, they even started the initiative of Drink Without Waste, so uh, definitely that's a goal. Uh, it depends a little bit on the time, how long it will take to build up these facilities in, in Hong Kong. So there will be, in, in the meantime, some period where we um, also need to export um, this green recycled material. In terms of what is the most difficult uh, ways to recycle, um, I would like to give it, in, uh, I'm sorry not, for not answering it uh, straight and, and directly, I would like to give it another thought. Um, I think uh, besides the recycling, we love to think about um, zero waste solutions. What does this mean? It's like by creating already products, we have in mind how we can reuse this product as a product um, and only what can't be used as a product then should go into the recycling, etc. So um, by um, having more that, um, you know, also from um, more well known under the, the name of the cradle to cradle, uh, mean like the product should be um, again like the, the start of the, the cycle. Um, I like to think about these solutions and um, yeah, hope to, to give you an, an idea. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Christians, uh, a question that came for concerning the, um, the, the waste management plant is what do you do with the ashes uh, and um, what about the emissions? Um, how is that uh, controlled so that uh, you know, the, there's not much more pollution coming from burning the, uh, the waste uh, than, uh, than anything else? Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll start with the point about uh, the pollution. So this plant has basically a whole, whole chemical factory to clean the, the flue gases. There's different kinds of uh, systems that will be used uh, for the, the sulfur and the chlorine that is available in flue gases. We use some lime and bicarbonate to, to neutralize these, uh, these acids. Um, for dioxin to capture the, to capture the dioxin, there will be an injection of active carbon. Um, to reduce the nitrogen oxides, we have uh, two, two systems. One is a, a little bit similar, like your car. Eh? You have to, to add some uh, add blue or something. something. So there's some ammonia injection to reduce the, the nitrogen. And on top, on, top, on top of this, there's a separate uh, catalytic filter to, uh, to, re to further reduce the, the nitrogen oxides. And then for the dust that is uh, inside the, the system, we have uh, two filtration systems, what they call backhouses. Uh, in, in a row to, to filter out. So that's yeah, a very advanced, uh, complete system allowing to go for very low emissions. As for the bottom ashes, um, yeah, the bottom ashes, it's, it still represents about 10% in terms of uh, volume. And now this plant will be taking out uh, steel, uh, ferrous metals. 
Um, but in the meantime, there's also, let's say, developments in the market about how to, there are possibilities to, to go one step further, to take out non-ferro non metals, even to take out gold, silver, and all kinds of precious metals inside. But that kind of, let's say, advanced or next step level of treatment may be something, maybe for the future. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Christians. Um, Secretary Wong, um, you said in your presentation that um, the majority of uh, uh, pollution um, in Hong Kong came from the production of electricity. Um, and of course, with all these electric vehicles uh, uh, coming in the, to the city and your ambitious plan to, to grow that number, um, how will you uh, manage to produce enough electricity in a clean way um, in order so that uh, these vehicles can drive around and yet you not have more pollution into the city? Okay, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think you're talking about the carbon footprint. In Hong Kong currently, uh, electricity accounts for uh, more than two-thirds of Hong Kong's carbon uh, emissions, while uh, transportation accounts for about 20%, okay? Um, the power generation could be, say, uh, having more opportunity to go towards no or even zero carbon emissions with the use of the best technologies. So that would be one of the key strategies to firstly keep up the power supply. Currently in Hong Kong, uh, I would say that in the past few years, coal accounts for a significant portion of power generation, more than 50% in the past years. But this year, we've been already reducing the coal portion to some 20%. And then we would probably phase down or even phase out all the coal portion in the coming decade. So the power generation would be much cleaner in terms of air quality and also in terms of carbon emissions. And we have we would devise a plan to go towards zero carbon emissions in order to meet our carbon neutrality goal, carbon neutrality goal in the coming three decades. So that would be a very good infrastructure to enable or to support the electrification of vehicles so that we can also have the uh, zero, carb, zero, zero vehicle emissions in the coming time. So it has to go together to clean up the power supply and also to go towards new energy vehicles so that we can enjoy cleaner air and also go towards carbon neutral Hong Kong. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Secretary Wong, um, uh, are there any other incentives that the uh, Hong Kong government um, has in order to promote electrical vehicles? Um, for example, the tax, a vehicle tax, uh, um, as, uh, as of course uh, cars are uh, uh, very highly taxed in, in Hong Kong. Okay, uh, again, very good question. I think uh, the uh, last year's uh, record, uh, one EV out of every eight uh, new pirate vehicles uh, indicates that uh, our current uh, tax incentive has been working uh, reasonably good, right? Otherwise, it won't be having such a high ratio among all the cities in Asia. And in our recent budget, in fact, we have further increased the first registration taxation by certain percentage to make it uh, up to about Hong Kong dollar, 287.5 thousand. It's pretty good. For the average price the private cars, it means 100% wave of the registration fee uh, or tax. So it's pretty uh, attractive for the people because in order to make the population of EV would like to encourage more affordable model of EV to be available in Hong Kong with very encouraging taxation. And also the annual licensing tax for electric vehicles is much better than that for conventional vehicles. So for the initial taxation and also for the recurring taxations, both are favoring the use of electric vehicles. And 
the electricity tariff in Hong Kong is relatively uh, affordable. So if people are driving EV, they uh, say the fuel cost for the EV is much, much better than driving a conventional petrol car. So it would be very attractive. And as said, our subsidy scheme to help the uh, domestic estates to upgrade the existing car park, again, a very attractive subsidy scheme. Every parking space can enjoy up to 30,000 Hong Kong dollars upgrade free if they need uh, the trunking, the upgrade of the power supplies. So there are different means to give incentive for people to change to electric vehicle if they are going to replace their old one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Schweitzer, um, a question for you. Um, uh, can you share with us um, some of the new technologies that uh, your company has brought in um, to enable a, a more efficient um, waste separation and recycling? Um, and, uh, and maybe a, a free question. Um, I, I understood you have been in Hong Kong for eight years now. Uh, how easy or how difficult was it to set up uh, uh, your company and start rolling out uh, your, um, your solutions for uh, Hong Kong? Um, no, thanks for, for the question, Alexander. The, um, also, the, again, the, the second part, um, it's always, uh, you know, as the, the leader in recycling, so people trust and government obviously trust that we understand a little bit about recycling. And obviously at that time, um, all our plants had been in Europe. So the, the challenge was a little bit to say, okay, you know, we understand you know about recycling, but please show us the first plant in, in Asia. So it's a little bit like the, the chicken and egg. And so that's why we have been so happy and proud that uh, Hong Kong government after that worldwide tender selected us in and trusted us in implementing this electronic based recycling plant in Hong Kong and happily and proudly, um, you know, we didn't fail and we, we succeeded and, um, uh, you know, up to that, um, you know, the complaint rate from people is uh, below 0.000%. So people are normally pretty happy with our service, etc. cetera. So um, the, the challenge was always like having the first plant. And so, you know, as I mentioned, electronic base, um, in Hong Kong, um, then we started, the, for example, the car recycling in Shanghai, um, the uh, plastic recycling I've mentioned in Hong Kong, Japan, the bio-based recycling, the um, domestic-based recycling, um, etc. So they are, um, and last but not least, also hazardous waste recycling. So they are a different uh, part and uh, in terms of technology, I think the uh, biggest change, especially in the last few years, had been on one hand the optoelectronic development, the development in, in um, you know, capacity of um, computers um, and even the, the quantum technology, and last but not least also AI. So the solutions, um, you know, I've also mentioned in, in my presentation, they're based on, on combination of these new technologies and that's something what I think it's um, super interesting um, thinking about recycling um, combination with digitalization and um, artificial intelligence going hand in hand um, so our view and vision is this especially in Asia and we see that already in, in China happening um, it's the, the, the development will be uh, leapfrogging. So it's like, the, and this is more um, also towards our European colleagues that um, Europe needs to be on its toes, uh, not to miss that development what's actually happening here. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Christians, um, a question came in concerning the uh, fuel that you're, you're using to uh, um, to make your plant work. Um, yeah, I think it's a relevant question because of course, uh, if you're trying to do something about the environment and uh, you, you, you're using fuel, which also emits CO2, um, where do you stand then? So uh, can you elaborate on that? 
Uh, so the, the waste is basically the fuel. Eh? And I think the, the question is, is to some extent, how can this, um, uh, this such a plant avoid uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Yes. And I think this, this is the, the, the context is, first of all, the waste is now going to the landfill. And in the landfill, the, the waste will biodegrade and there's a release of methane. And methane is very uh, potent greenhouse gas. So by taking that away, uh, you, you, you reduce uh, uh, methane emissions. Actually, it's, it's, it's less known, but in the whole world, for all the existing landfills, all the landfills are responsible for an estimated 8 to 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the world. So it's a substantial contributor. The second thing is that nowadays for the production of, of uh, electricity, there's still a lot of fossil fuel is being used. And of course, there will be a phase out in the future, as, as Secretary Wong mentioned. But fossil fuels is, um, is emitting CO2, uh, whereas waste has some uh, biogenic part, what they say, which is then considered as a renewable form of energy. And then the third way that it contributes to the reduction of methane, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases, is also that it allows for some recycling of, of materials like metals. And so you don't have to use um, yeah, fossil fuels or do the CO2 emission for, the, for, for, the, for producing new resources because you, you, you are able to, to recover them from the plant. So in that way, it helps to contribute to the um, reduction of, of, of greenhouse gases. Okay, thank you. Um, the uh, the um, recycling stores are a great idea, uh, Secretary Wong. Um, can you tell us more about it and uh, how much waste do they collect? Uh, and, and, and then how, where does it go from there on? Okay. The uh, recycling stores have, have just been a little open there for a few months. So the data... Uh, to be uh, analyzed that, uh, in the coming time, but the response has been really encouraging. People like it, okay? Um, people say, uh, even during the COVID-19 period, okay, they still create uh, rubbish and also recyclables, right? And, uh, and they can uh, go to uh, visit a board, uh, so they would like to have some places to visit. They find the recycling stores very clean, attractive, so uh, parents uh, bring children to go there to learn about recycling. Um, and also during the COVID-19 period, um, people buy uh, more takeaway food, for instance, and there are more disposable plastics included uh, in, in containing their food, right? And those uh, uh, disposables are mostly recyclable. So in our recycling stores, uh, the initial data shows that more than half of the collected recyclables are plastics, different types of plastics, okay? Even though they are lightweighted, but in total, they are accounting for more than 50%. So uh, it's been encouraging. Uh, in fact, this kind of recycling stores have been in Hong Kong for some years, but not in such a form. Uh, they were organized by different uh, organizations, uh, used different images and different reward scheme. This time, we have a new branding, unify all of them and expand the coverage and also provide more uh, financial support to make it better and also unify the uh, reward scheme uh, with the uh, 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 reward point collection cup that can be applied across all recycling stores in Hong Kong. Not only about the uh, stores, but they also provide mobile stations. Because in Hong Kong, land is limited. So we can't always open a store at different districts. So we are having more than 100 mobile stations to serve this population in Hong Kong. So together, they are collecting much more recyclables than the earlier version, more than double, uh, given the past experience in the uh, last few months. And uh, I think uh, Hong Kong people will support it more in the coming time. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Secretary Wong. Uh, I get many questions also, um, uh, um, about you know how to go to the Hong Kong market um, and does the Hong Kong administration provide legal assistance for European companies uh, taking part in in green technology projects um, and uh, I can only suggest that um, all interested uh, companies and entrepreneurs uh, register in their local um, trade associations just like uh, the Belgium Hong Kong Society for example um, and the Dutch Chamber um, and that from there on um, uh, they will be put in touch with uh, the right people 
in Hong Kong for them to uh, to start and develop their business. Um, so um, yes, we are we are now running a bit over time, uh, but maybe um, uh, one last question. Um, and it is concerning the taxis in Hong Kong. It's a very practical question um, uh, for you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Do you see that, or when do you see that all taxis will start running uh, on the on electrical uh, instead of uh, diesel oil or gas? Okay. Um, I think we do wish to electrify all the taxi in Hong Kong. Um, in the past time, uh, the taxi used the diesel, but long time ago, we changed all of them to the uh, LPG, the liquefied uh, petrol gas, much cleaner, okay, but still with emissions and also carbon emissions. So the next step is to make them electric vehicles. But you know, in Hong Kong, taxi, they're probably the most challenging species on earth. They want almost 24 hours per day, okay? And running long distance, okay? And also many of them are owned by individual taxi drivers and not owned by several big companies. So the conversion would be challenging. But I said earlier that we are going to test out different commercial vehicles in Hong Kong. And we'd like to gain solid experience within a few years so that say by 2025, we can have a more solid plan to change all these or most of them, including taxi. So if there are nice ideas and relevant technologies and vehicles type that can help Hong Kong to change taxi to become EV, we would be very happy. Okay, but bear in mind that it's challenging. But we would roll out two pilot schemes to test e-taxi in Hong Kong um, in two dis dis districts so that we can gain better understanding about the challenges so that we can pave the way ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Wong. Um, all right, uh, well, I, uh, this concludes uh, our session um, and I would like to thank uh, our speakers of today, uh, Secretary Wong of the Hong Kong SAR, uh, Dr. Axel Schweitzer of uh, Alba Group and uh, Mr. Ivan Christians of uh, Keppel Segers in Belgium for their interesting uh, presentations and giving us uh, a very interesting insight in uh, what they are doing and how this uh, vision is being rolled out. Uh, today as we speak uh, to make uh, Hong Kong uh, a cleaner city and a, uh, a, a more um, a, a nicer city to live on in the future. So uh, congratulations to, uh, to all of you for uh, your, your achievements and thank you to um, all our viewers uh, and um, thank you to uh, the uh, Hong Kong Trade uh, Council and the um, Economic Trade Office in Brussels and Berlin for organizing this uh, webinar. Thank you very much and see you next time. Goodbye.